Blacks in Technology. Black, 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 blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. What's up, Bit Family? We are back with another exciting episode of the Bit Tech Talk podcast. On this episode, Greg explores the world of user experience with Imani Nichols. Imani Nichols is the founder and senior UX researcher at Yizzy Research. Based in New York City, Imani founded Yizzy Research to help businesses understand the pain points, desires, experiences, and journeys of their end users and customers. She provides research-based insights that enable businesses to design and engineer products and services that their customers enjoy. And now the host of our show, Blacks and Technology founder, Greg Greenlee. Tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of where you're from, a little bit about your education. Yeah, I'm a yeah. UX researcher and for people listening, UX stands for user experience. I'm a user experience researcher based here in Manhattan in New York. Um, I didn't grow up too far from here. I'm originally from Brooklyn. I grew up in the Crown Heights neighborhood of Brooklyn. And then at some point, my family and I moved to the South, to Delaware, where I consider the South, <laughs> um, to Delaware, where I finished um, being raised there. And then I went to college even further down south in Virginia. I went to University of Virginia where I studied media studies and minored in sociology. And that's where I started learning about research, which is what I do now. Excellent. The, the Cavaliers, right? That's Yes, that's um, the cools. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Give us a little bit of background about kind of how you became interested in, in technology. I never had an interest in technology specifically, at least not mm -hmm. as a career path. So I mentioned when I went to University of Virginia, also known as UVA, um, I did research there for most of my, my tenure. I was an undergrad research assistant for a variety of professors working on different types of projects that were like qualitative and also quantitative as well. And I wanted to continue doing research in some capacity as a professional, but I didn't know how that would manifest. Um, thankfully, I had a mentor who was an alumna of the university who was a UX researcher in New York at the time. And so I'm thankful she and I got linked up um, because she taught me about UX research prior to her. I'd never even heard of it. <laughs> so she told me about it. She explained what she did day to day. And she told me that I probably would be good at it since I had all this research experience from undergrad. And as I dug deeper into UX research, I learned very quickly that it mostly exists in the tech space. So I, I wasn't really interested in tech per se. It was the fact that my interest in UX research took me to tech. Um, since UX research, for whatever reason, seems to be most dominant in the tech space. Right. So that's how I became interested. It was more like, a, I guess, a tangential entry into the tech space. Nice, nice. And I like that word, tangential. Might have to use that sometime. <laughs> no, some, I was actually talking to someone earlier, and they used it. I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to use that one. <laughs> <laughs> Great minds think alike. When you hear an interesting word, steal right. it and then use it later on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. So... You mentioned uh, what the, the the letters stand for, the abbreviation UX stands for user experience, but tell us what a user experience researcher is. Yeah, it's always interesting because UX research is so straightforward, but yet it's always so hard to define to other people. So I always say it's someone who studies users of a product to understand how they interact with the, interact with the product itself. And the product is usually a digital product. So think like a website, a web-based experience, an app on your phone. And researchers, we try to answer at a higher level, how do users behave? How do they engage with this actual experience? What are their pain points? We usually try to understand how users uh, behave, how they think, and how they feel. And we uh -huh. try to use our insights to help to help the product team, including the product managers and designers, um, understand how to design products that people actually like and therefore want to use. So that may manifest as us observing how people actually use a product and asking questions about that and giving them tasks to complete to see how they actually can achieve those tasks in the app or in the web experience. Uh -huh. It can also manifest as us doing interviews with customers to understand how the product fits into their lives, to understand them more as people, and to help design products around their humanity, basically. So it manifests in many different ways in terms of how we do it. But ultimately, it's just someone who tries to understand end users of a product. I like that. Um, here's something interesting, uh, an interesting question I'll pose to you. Um, because I think when people think about 
customers, let me ask you this. When you say customers, right. Or who who are you who are you referring to? Because I, I had a an experience, a, a, a conversation that I had with a person who uh, was a UI UX uh, person, uh, and a lot of people when they think about you know customers, they think about people outside of You have your internal stakeholders who you work with at your actual job, and you also have your external stakeholders who I think of as the customers. Excellent, and that's that's. Um, I, I wanted you to you to explain it because uh, I felt it was necessary to kind of make that distinction. Um, although you know, there you know, it, customers are, are, are is, is a general term. Uh, the distinction between internal and external customers. Um, I wanted you to kind of, you know, clarify that because I had an interesting discussion with um, a person who works for a large retailer. Uh, and when he said he was a UI UX person, I, my mind instantly went to the people who shop at this particular retailer. Right. Uh, and instead, he was referring to going around talking to the people inside the stores, uh, employees who are working in bakery. I was like, oh, yeah, I guess if they were, you know, to use an internal app in order to, you know, maybe, uh, you know, order ingredients or something like that, or however, you know, whatever they needed to do, you would need to know, um, you know, what their experience is um, uh, with using that app. So, you know, they are internal, they're employees to the company, but you need to know how to make their experience a lot better so that they actually use it because they're, you know, they're not only use it, but use it in the correct way too. Right. So uh, I thought that was a very interesting uh, discussion and it gave me a different perspective when I, when I, you know, think about customers. Exactly. That's a good example. It also, what's really important too, in thinking about customers is if the company is B2B, right. Or if it's B2B mm. or what's the other B2C to be right. That matters as well. Like I I've mostly worked with um, companies, at least as a researcher where the company was um, direct to consumer. So mm -hmm the end user was the consumer. However, when you gave that example, I was thinking of a company like Uber, Uber Eats or DoorDash, right? Where okay. the customer could be like someone like me just ordering some pizza, right? But mm -hmm. it could also be the, the Uber Eats driver as well. Yeah. Um, it could also be the restaurant owner. Um, so yeah, I, I think that it definitely matters if the organization is like direct to consumer or not. That definitely um, changes the context of who the customers and stakeholders are. And so uh, you, you gave us... Uh... A little bit about uh, about your action, your education, your background. But what what are some of the necessary skills uh, you th you think are needed to become a UX researcher? Yeah, so the skills I think that people really need. Um, this is obvious, but having research. Um, experience. UX research isn't really something that you can learn by reading a book. It's very practical. It's very um, experimental and ex experimental and um, experiential as well. Mm -hmm. So you definitely have to learn by doing and making mistakes. So when I say um, knowing how to do research, having knowledge of research methods, having applied knowledge like usability testing, user interviews, focus group moderation, survey research, diary studies, field research, so on and so forth. So I think that's like the, the, the top hard skill to have is actual research experience. And then I would say in terms of soft skills, being a good listener, we talk to people all the time, um, mm -hmm. being a good note taker, taking notes on what they're saying. Um, you don't have to be a super extrovert. I'm not, but being a good conversationalist is important. Um, being organized because you work with a lot of different types of um, data points and you have to keep it all together. So I think those are really the top four 
um, soft skills. So being able to listen, being able to take notes, being able to speak well, and also being organized. And also, I would say another one too, is just knowing how to balance different temperaments. As a researcher, when you have an active project, you're working with so many different people. And I mean, as anyone who works with people knows, everyone has a different energy (laughs) and vibe and personality. (laughs) And there are some people who are just easy to get along with and there are others who are not. And so just having like maturity and patience to manage all of that is also critically important as well. Interesting. I I wouldn't have, I would, I would have thought that most people would be cooperative, uh, I guess, in in the research, but is, is that your experience or you, you, you come across people who like, don't want to talk kind of, or, you know, people that you kind of have to pull information out of. Yeah. So generally most people are pretty pleasant because they choose to participate, right? Like Uh, um, I've never been in a, I've never been in a situation where I've forced anyone to do, to participate in research. So generally people are fine, but it's not uncommon. And I'm sure if any researcher listens to this, they're probably nodding their head. (laughs) It's not (laughs) uncommon to do a, a usability test or an interview where you need the person to talk and they just don't give you anything. Right. They say, yes, no, yes, no. And it's not really, it's not really a good conversation. So I would say most people generally that I've worked with, they're usually pretty, um, pretty good to work with. But occasionally you do get people who just won't talk. Or if people are wanting to talk to you, they may be really upset. And I may be the closest person um, to the company that they actually get a chance to speak to Mm -hmm. the closest live person. So you may get the brunt of their frustrations. That doesn't happen often, but it has happened a few times. So generally, I would say people are pretty pleasant. But occasionally, I do have to pull pull it out of people. (laughs) Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and I and I apologize uh, beforehand because I know I said that I, I, I usually don't pivot or, uh, or ask questions outside of uh, some of the questions that I send over. Uh, but this this is kind of in the, uh, the same lane. Uh, but I wanted to get your opinion on something um, or, or you know, get your thoughts on something, I should say, because we're, we're in a, a very, I guess, precarious age of myths and disinformation. And with the, I guess, the advent of, of social media and now everyone thinks that they are a trained researcher, uh, <laughs> um, you, you get a lot of nonsense, right, on, on social media uh, you know, things that are spread through memes uh, and that type of thing. And and one of my things is that people don't do, and, and, and not to say that I, I do like proper research, but a lot of people who spread like misinformation and things like that, they don't actually do proper, I, what I feel is proper research. They'll pull something from an article or, or YouTube video, and they'll say, oh, that's, you know, do your research. I've done my research. Look at this YouTube video. So let, let me ask you this. What do you think constitutes proper research? Like, what's a process, um, a research kind of process look like? That's a great question. I, I definitely think it varies in terms of what research looks like. I think it varies in terms of a type of research you're doing. So if you are a medical researcher, it's very different than being a UX researcher at a tech company, right? right? As opposed to a market researcher or, I don't know, a legal researcher. So I think it varies in that respect. But I would say for UX research, what really constitutes good research is having a research plan ahead of time. So what mm. is your hypothesis or the assumptions that you're testing? What methods are you using? Who mm-hmm. are you recruiting? How are you recruiting them? What are the research questions? What is the discussion guide if that's needed? So I think that having a solid plan ahead of time is what um, makes research solid. I also think that getting stakeholders involved pretty early on, early on in the research planning process is also important. So let's say, for example, usually when I'm planning a research study, I'll ask for the opinions of the product managers, the product marketing managers, the UX designers. Um, if I have other researchers on the team as well, I'll ask them too, just to uh-huh. get some perspective and some buy-in. And also the people I mentioned, um, some of them are the ones who actually can take the research and actually apply it. So it's important that they know what's going on and they have input as to what I'm actually asking people during the interview sessions or during the during the usability testing sessions for example so i think what makes research reputable and solid is being able to have a a research i keep using the word solid (laughs) keep having um, a sound research plan ahead of time and also getting stakeholder buy-in and getting their opinions because you want to make sure that you're asking questions of your customers and end users 
that yield answers that people at the company can actually use. So answers mm -hmm. that the product managers can actually use to help prioritize features on the roadmap to help mm -hmm. designers understand what to actually design in the app or on the website. And, and thanks. Thank you for that, that clarification. Um, it's, it's one of my, it's, it's a pet peeve of mine. Um, I'm on, I'm on Facebook a lot. And so, <laughs> um, as someone who's on Facebook a lot, I see a lot of nonsense and discussions and things like that. And, you know, people kind of throw their opinions or uh, their, their so-called facts uh, in, in discussions. And, you know, I have, a, I have a serious problem when people try to pass off something as fact and it's not thoroughly like checked out and it's not properly researched and they and so that's why I asked that question. Anyhow, let me <laughs> let me get back to uh, the the regular questions. So, <laughs> one thing that I like to do because I, I I've you know spoken to uh, classrooms and you know college students and things like that is I like to tell people how much I make. Like I'm not ashamed or I'm, I don't try to make it private because I think it's important for uh, people, especially if they are looking to get into tech. Uh, and especially if they're people within the black community uh, so they can, you know, see like what could be on the horizon for them. Right. As far as salary, uh, how much can a UX researcher make in terms of salary? Yeah, it varies pretty significantly depending on location, seniority, company size, right? If you're okay. in the Bay Area, which is where like all the UX stuff is happening, you probably get a really high salary there, but it's also um, that area has a high cost of living. Same here with New York. Yeah. I would say in terms of range overall, I would imagine somewhere between like 60K if you're just like getting started at a smaller company all mm -hmm. the way up maybe through 200K or more if you're like super senior Nice. Um, 10 plus years of experience at a company like Facebook or um, Amazon or something. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would say, it, which is a pretty significant range. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like I guess it, it depends a lot on like um, those factors I mentioned, so location, seniority, and company size. But I think it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty well compensated career, which is why I think it's probably so popular. But yeah, I would All say right. somewhere in that range, and th there probably may be some unicorns making way more than that if you account for things like profit sharing, stocks, bonuses. So yeah, the, the range I gave was probably what I would estimate for like base salary. And so how, how does someone get started? I know you, you told us a little bit about kind of your journey uh, and that, you know, you kind of had a mentor that came to you and said, hey, you know, this this might be a, a good path for you to take. But how, how would you recommend someone get started in becoming a UX researcher? Oh, it's such a mystery. I mean, I, I always say that uh, there's a, a, a thing amongst UX researchers that none of us know how we got into it. <laughs> it's just <laughs> one of those things that you just kind of fall into it. It's not a clear career path. Like if you want to become a doctor or a lawyer, it's pretty clear what you need to do. It's not like that with UX research. So for me personally, I started with academic research as an undergrad at school. Mm -hmm. And then um, I did UX research very briefly after I graduated, but wanted to try something different. Then I did um, market research for like a year and a half. And I didn't really like that. And I wasn't all that great at it, honestly. And then I went back to UX research, which I enjoy. So I think a lot of people get started with academic research. There are people who get their PhDs and masters in human computer interaction or psychology or something related to UX in that way. That's a good place to start. Or starting with um, being a designer, it's mm. not uncommon for designers to also transition into research. Right. Um, some people start in market research or consumer insights. There are a variety of paths to come into it, but those usually seem to be the top three that I've witnessed either from myself or from other researchers. Um, one of the things about UX research, it's there's no one path to it, like I mentioned a few moments ago, and that's good mm -hmm. and bad. I mean, it's bad because if you're trying to break into it, it's hard to know where to start or if you're doing things quote, right, end quote. However, um, it can also be really good because since there's no typical UX researcher, you have a chance to really define what that means for you if you want to do that. So yeah, it's, it's like a double, a double edged sword there in that respect. Right. The Bit Foundation has established featured partnerships and programs with companies such as Amazon, AT&T, CompTIA, tech stars, and more to provide our members with the resources we want and need to thrive and succeed in this tech ecosystem. To learn more, visit foundation.blacksandtechnology.net. Join now. And remember, membership is free.
tell us a little bit about as a UX researcher, what do you do on a day to day? It varies pretty significantly, which I hate when people give that response when you ask them what they do every day, <laughs> but it's true, <laughs> but it's true. It, it varies significantly. And also, um, so I own my- That, that own. keeps it interesting though, right? It does. It definitely does. And I own my own research company, which I know we'll probably talk about a little bit later in the episode, but on a day-to-day, it varies. So I may, if I'm doing an active research project, I'll be writing research plans, um, recruiting participants, conducting the actual research, um, scheduling time with participants, following up with incentives, analyzing notes from the research, sharing insights with the team. If I'm at a, um, if I'm on a longer engagement, creating a, ro- a research roadmap, um, if there's a repository, updating that research repository with my notes, with recordings from sessions. And of course, because I do work for myself and I am, um, I work on a contract basis, applying for contracts. And also I have a coaching program where I coach aspiring and current UX researchers and I help them get their application materials together to apply for UX research roles. So mm. I may be doing a little bit of that too. Or, and I, I also produce my own podcast, um, the Izzy Research Podcast. So it's a podcast about research, primarily UX research, but I have other researchers come on um, at times as well. So I may be producing that. So again, it really varies depending on if I'm working on a client project, if a research study is active, if I have like um, coaching mentees lined up. So it just, it varies quite a bit, but that's usually, it's usually one of those handful of tasks. Sounds like you have a ton of spare time on your hands. (laughs) 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 Yeah, but thankfully I I enjoy what I do. So it's it's easy to find the energy to do it. But yeah, it it is a lot, but like, um, you know, just juggling different things on different days. Right, right. And when you enjoy it, it doesn't seem like work and it just, you know, you just kind of flow, right? Exactly. Yeah. I think that's the word for it in psychology. I think it's called flow. Like when you just really? get in the zone. <laughs> yeah. It, there's a psychological, con- or I could totally be lying to, I could be making it up. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is called flow. Like when you find something that you really enjoy, time just goes by. So yeah, yeah. I, I do think that research for me is one of those things for me, like at this point in my career. So w- what do you think out of all those things are, are, are like the most important function of your job? Yeah, I would say practically is actually conducting the research and also making sure that my internal stakeholders like product managers and designers actually understand the findings and can apply them if they need to. Mm. And also at a more higher level, being a liaison between the users or the customers and the internal stakeholders like that I mentioned Mm -hmm. Um, So I would definitely say getting, collecting the data and also making sense of it and relaying that sense to internal stakeholders as well. Speaking, speaking of that kind of let's, let's walk through that, that process, Um, you know, and and you don't have to go, you know, super in depth about, about it, but tell us kind of a little bit about what that process is from, you know, kind of beginning to end, Uh, you know, just like a, a quick you know, run through of what that process is like. Like, what is it like to like start a project all the way through delivering the insights? Exactly. Yeah. So I had mentioned a few moments ago, um, I mentioned like the research plan and getting by stakeholder buy-in early on. So that's usually the first step. And then once I get the green light from the stakeholders to move forward, then I do recruitment for participants, um, which is not usually the most fun part. <laughs> People sometimes don't show up, they cancel, and it's kind of hard to reschedule sometimes. Yeah. That's what I do next. And then I conduct the actual research. So let's say if I'm doing user interviews, I'll conduct the actual interviews. And then once the research is conducted, I'll go ahead and analyze and synthesize the findings. So I'll review the notes from the interviews to find patterns and themes to see what answers I found to the research questions that were on the research plan. And then I'll take those and put those in a presentation usually and share it with um, those internal stakeholders like the product managers, um, designers, salespeople, et cetera, depending on which context I'm in. And then once I share it with them, I usually follow up with them to see if there's anything else they need from me, if there are any other questions that are unanswered that I can use another research study for. So that's mm-hmm. usually that's usually the flow in the more abbreviated um, sense. Nice, nice. And without naming like names or companies or anything like that, are there companies out there where you go through this entire process? And I, I'm not sure, you know, what the time frame is like for a process like this. Uh, that when you get to the end and you kind of present all your findings. Uh, that they like totally go the opposite way and say, yeah, well, you know, thank you. We're not, we're not going to use these, you know, these, these findings, but, you know, we, we, we kind of think we have a 
a handle on it and they go an opposite way and then things like fail miserably or, <laughs> or, or, are, there, yeah. are there moments like that so in terms of being a researcher it does happen often when you deliver insights and they're not always applied and sometimes mm-hmm. they're not applied for a variety of reasons there may not be enough bandwidth to actually help build what you suggested or improve what you suggested Um, There may not be enough time. That's always an issue. There may not be enough money to put towards creating X, Y, and Z. So there are usually a variety of reasons why stakeholders can't move forward. Or um, if they already have something in flight, it may be too much to adjust it at the moment that they get the research. Mm -hmm. So it definitely varies in terms of reasons why, but it definitely does happen. BIT is always focused on forming new partnerships and opportunities to assist the community and our members with their continued professional growth and development. If you'd like to partner with us, send an email, inquiries at blacksintechnology.net. So let's let's talk about um, your your company and I don't how do you, how do you pronounce that is that Izzy or Yizzy Yizzy mm-hmm. okay Yizzy yep. Research so tell us a little bit about Yizzy Research and and why why you chose to start your own business yeah so Yizzy Research it's a UX research company um, and I always wanted to work for myself and have that flexibility I like being able to pick who I work with. Um, I like having the variety of clients and also being able to work on projects that are really engaging. So that's mm-hmm. why I started my own um, company. It's something I've always wanted to do. I didn't know until fairly recently that I wanted to do a UX research company, um, but I've always wanted to own a business, even as a child. Where, where, where do you think that came from? Did you have like, in, in, you know, influences as a, as a, uh, as a young child that, you know, you kind of drew from and said, Hey, like that, I like that. I, the idea of working for myself and and the flexibility. And I think I want to do that later on in life. I don't think so. Yes. And no, I would say no, because it probably wasn't consciously looking at someone and thinking that, okay. but, um, both of my parents at some point when I was much younger, they were entrepreneurs. Um, so mm-hmm. they own like different businesses again when I was much younger. So I'm pretty sure like growing up, seeing them um, work on their own and work for themselves was probably an inspiration um, by virtue of osmosis. But was like, did I consciously think that? Most likely not. But you know how it is. If you're just in an environment, something (laughs) as a kid, you're going to do it too. (laughs) Exactly. Well, shout out to moms and pops for (laughs) (laughs) for subconsciously inspiring you. (laughs) Exactly. So, so tell us about some of the services you, that uh, you provide. Yeah, so I provide um, UX research services. So I do discovery and evaluative UX research. So evaluative UX research is what most people associate with UX research. So think something like usability testing, for example. And mm-hmm. discovery research is more open-ended, um, more like strategic research that isn't really centered around um, specific usability about a product, but more so about learning who the users are. So I do both of those, and that can include things like interviews, journey maps, personas, usability testing, focus groups, field research, where we're able to actually go out in public again, car sorts. Um, and also in addition to doing UX research, I also produce the Yizzy Research Podcast, where I talk about research with other researchers. And also I have the Yizzy Research Coaching Program, um, which is geared at aspiring and practicing UX researchers who want to work on their job application collateral. So think like their LinkedIn accounts, cover letters, resumes, portfolios, mock mm-hmm. interviewing skills. I help them as well. So I take a lot of what I've learned because it was kind of hard for me to actually break into UX research and figure out how I needed to present myself because you need to do it in a very particular way, but it's not always clear how you're supposed to do that. So that's why I started the coaching program element of it. So that's what I do. So I do um, UX research and also coaching for UX researchers as well. Very nice. Very nice. So what are, you know, because I've I've worked in companies that have like UI UX personnel that, that are employees of the company. What are some of the benefits of like hiring just a UX research firm? Yeah. And in terms of hiring a UX research firm, you get very intimate knowledge about your user base. I always say like market research is good for like the big picture and it's good for Mm. collecting big data. However, when you need small data, like 
that human touch or a sense of um, narrative or understanding your users more intimately, that's where UX research really is a strength. Mm -hmm. um, you get that expertise that you just can't get from market research or from data science. Um, and also bringing in a third party firm for someone who doesn't actually work at the company, because we obviously don't have any company knowledge if we haven't worked there before. We bring a unique perspective as individuals coming into this dynamic mm -hmm. and also the research skills as well. So I think that the, 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 what I'm saying is that UX research, hiring a UX research or a UX research firm definitely gives companies a competitive advantage um, because a lot of companies don't do UX research and they don't know their customers and they, their customers, if you actually talk to your customers, they will tell you what they want. People are not shy when it comes to things like that to tell you what they like and dislike and what they want to see. Right. So I, I definitely think that the major benefit is that the company doing the hiring gets a significant competitive advantage over their competitors. What's up, everyone? We hope that you're enjoying this episode of the Blacks and Technology Big Tech Talk podcast. Do you or someone you know have a dope story that they want to share with our bit audience? Blacks and Technology is seeking guests to be on our podcast. We're looking to highlight the journeys and experiences of Black women and men in the tech industry. So if you know of someone, send them our way. Shoot us an email to contact us at blacksandtechnology.net or Click on the link in the show notes and fill out our form. We're looking to hear from you. I like that you mentioned just having a different perspective because being inside a company, you, you can kind of become, uh, what's a good word term for the, you become so embedded in the culture, right? Uh, that you don't have that fresh perspective uh, that someone coming from the outside might have, right? You're kind of uh, entrenched in the culture of the company. Uh, so you, you you become kind of biased. Um, and not not saying that all, you know, UI, UI UX people are like this, but it, it's good to kind of have, you know, that outside perspective coming in where you don't have the bias or you don't have the, you know, kind of the, some of the, the, the things that the company has done in the past and things like that. You don't have that history uh, so to speak, and so you can you can you can ask questions and and look at things uh, in, in a different way than someone who has been at a company for like let's say a few years or whatever uh, has. So yeah, I also think that coming in as a third party, as a contractor or as mm -hmm. a consultant, like you said, I'm not entrenched in the business, so right. I can move a little bit more freely amongst like different departments and different teams and rallying the mm. troops with little resistance. Um, I feel like when you work somewhere full-time, a lot of companies, especially big companies, tend to be very siloed just because they're so big. Right. And when you come in as a consultant or a contractor and you have to pull in all these different parts, it's easier to pull in people from different parts of the company because you're not, you're not there all the time and you're there right. for a certain time period. So there's a sense of, okay, well, we have to, if you want to get these insights by the end of this contract, we kind of need to collaborate with you. So there's a sense of that as well. So yeah, I definitely think that coming in as a third party helps me move a little bit more freely amongst teams that may be more siloed. I love the fact that you are coaching as well. Like it's, it's, it's your way of giving back. You know, there, there are people who once they get to a certain status, or a certain point in their career, uh, they kind of want to cruise, right? Because they're comfortable at that point. Like, Hey, you know, I'm making good money. I'm, I'm, you know, doing what I love. And there's something different about a person who can reach back and they can give back and say, Hey, you know, I understand the struggles and that it, some of the obstacles that that I had to overcome to get there, and I, I want to give back and, and make it easier for the for the next person. It takes a special person to do something like that because then you're you're a little bit you're a lot more uh, more selfless uh, in that aspect, and not everyone can do that, right? So kudos kudos to you for for uh, for coaching and, and giving back. Oh shucks, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thanks. I appreciate that. But I, it's, I, so for my coaching program, I do charge for that. However, I do realize that not everyone obviously can afford to pay for support. Right. So that's the reason why I did the podcast, which is free and will always be free. I share a lot of knowledge there as well in terms of like interviewing and getting your portfolio together and what do researchers actually do, et cetera, et cetera. So I try to balance that out too, because I'm, I'm not oblivious to the fact that not everyone can afford a coaching program. So yeah. the, the podcast is free. There's also a lot of information there too, for people as well. Excellent. And we'll, we'll get into a little bit more about that because mm -hmm. that, I mean, I think that's, 
you know, it for me, you know, blacks and technology has always been about, you know, kind of providing information and, and supporting one another and community. So I love to see another uh, black person in tech uh, doing the same thing, right? Because when, when you know, I, I uh, I say this quite often on on um, in the past podcast, but when when I got started doing podcasts, there weren't a lot of black people doing podcasts at all. Period. Like not in tech for sure, right? And so um, I, I started seeing uh, like this expansion of of black people in tech doing podcasts, and I was I thought like this is great, like this is what we need. Uh, because not a lot of us are out there doing it. And uh, it's great to kind of hear us being in this space, being in this ecosystem, providing the knowledge and being experts in our field and giving back to, to others, right? Uh, so I think, I think that's you having a podcast. I mean, uh, on top of you running a business uh, and you working uh, and all the other things that you have to deal with in life that you still have the time. I mean, and then you're coaching, you're giving back in that, in that respect. And then also producing a podcast. Like I, I, you know, I know firsthand that's not easy. Like it, it takes a lot of cycles to be able to, to, to do something like that. So again, once again, kudos, kudos to you for, um, for giving back and, and, you know, doing this podcast and providing people with, uh, you know, the knowledge and, and things like that. Do you have a product or service that you would like to share with the BIT audience? Or maybe you'd like to support the BIT community and do your part in helping us with Stomping the Divide. Start by sponsoring one of our podcasts. Please email us at contact us at blacksintechnology.net. Tell us, you know, what's the hardest part about owning your own business, a tech business? Yeah, I would say the hardest part about owning a company, especially as a researcher, is learning how to actually be a consultant on a short, a relatively short term basis. If you're at a company full time as a traditional nine to five employee, you're there until you choose to leave or you get laid off or you quit or you get fired. Right. When you're there as a contract or a consultant, you're there until you're there for six months, eight months, a year. And that's pretty set in stone unless something changes Um, and learning how to adapt to different clients every few months is something I'm still Mm. trying to get adjusted to. So I I like the variety. I like trying different, um, different things, working with different companies in different industries. However, it is kind of hard sometimes to figure out, okay, how do they do it here? Right? Like what are the dynamics here? Like who can I actually talk to as an advocate? Who's really pro research who's not whose temperament is really compatible with mine with Mm. mine um whose temperament isn't um who can help me with my tech stuff right like trying to figure all this stuff out every few months or once a year can be um a learning experience and that's definitely something that's been the trickiest part is just learning how to actually adjust to new um, working environments every few months wow yeah i i I was suspected that you know that i mean because onboarding is hard anyhow Right. Like every time I, I work at I work at a uh, technology solutions company, we're consultants and, and we go into we either augment teams or uh, we provide a team to to certain businesses and things like that. So I definitely understand the aspect of uh, going into a new company and and or a new team or, or you know, and, and things like that. So one of the things that I've, I've found is that you know, onboarding is a problem for almost every company. Every company that I've been a part of has never gotten onboarding completely right, right? It's, it's, there's always gaps in how they onboard somebody. So with you, you know, coming in as a, as a UX researcher, I can only imagine, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they definitely don't have a, a policy or something, in, in, you know, in place, an uh, onboarding plan for, you know, somebody who's doing research. So I can only imagine how, how difficult that could be uh, at, at, at some of these companies, right? So yeah. 
especially since due to the pandemic, everything is remote, at least as of right, mm, as of this recording, yeah. everything is still remote. Yeah, um, yeah. So that definitely, I know a lot of companies are struggling. They're used to doing everything in person. Now, how do you onboard people virtually? So that's also been a challenge as well, but I, I'm getting the impression. So I've been working full time as a contractor since February of 2021. So not very long as of this mm. recording. Um, okay. However, um, I've noticed very quickly that I'm going to have to create my own sort of research onboarding. So I, if I get an onboarding, I was going to ask that. Myself, <laughs> yeah, I have to have some sort of research onboarding I create. So figuring out who the stakeholders are, just having a meeting with them initially, um, figuring out where documents are stored, things like that, and just trying yeah. to pull those people in myself. So that's something I'm going to have to learn how to do. Um, however, I have had contracts where that was already done for me, which was nice. Oh, but for the, for the contracts where that's not done for me, I definitely have to start thinking of a way to actually get that information myself and kind of mm. give myself a UX research specific onboarding for that particular contract. So right. that's something I'm still learning how to do too. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Like, you know, how 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 can you like create like a run book uh, on, on uh, you know, getting the, the information and, and things like that that you, that you need in, in order to be able to, to successfully do your job. So yeah, kudos. Okay. So tell me what, what, what do you think is, uh, you know, kind of the most fun part of owning a tech business? I would say one of the most fun parts so far has been the ability to pick and choose who I work with. If I, I've turned contracts down because I just wasn't feeling it, frankly, for a variety of different reasons. And it's nice being able to just say no to someone, to someone or something you just don't want to do. <laughs> That's nice. And also um, being able to flex different research muscles. So I may be working with one client that's really focused on like usability testing, but another client wants to do a lot of survey research or interviews, for example. So it's nice being able just to try out different methods and not having to commit to one or the other. Um, so I like that too. So just being able to have some flexibility in who I actually work with and also being able to flex different research skills. Nice. Nice. And so are, are you at the point right now in your company that you're hiring or are you still gr- kind of growing the company? So I'm still growing. It's just me right now and probably will be for a while. So I'm not okay. at that point. I'm definitely not at that point yet, but I would I would love to be at that point if I do um, continue to develop with UX research and with Yizzy research. Um, however, yeah, I'm not there yet. Well, you know, uh, every, every company has a beginning and uh, hopefully this is the beginning of, of something big and, and great for you. So, so tell me a little bit about, um, let's, let's switch to, to your podcast. Let's talk about that. Uh, what, what's the name of it? What's the name of your podcast? It's the Yizzy Research Podcast, and that's spelled Y-Z-Z-I. Um, and that's how everything that's branded for the, for the business is spelled as well. And tell us, what, what what's behind the name? What, is it, so, what, what does that um, mean? <laughs> so one of my nicknames is Izzy, I-Z-Z-Y, and it was just that backwards. Um, I couldn't, I had a hard time <laughs> thinking of a business name and that was actually the temporary name, but I kind of just stuck with it. <laughs> okay. So um, I like that. Yeah. So I just kind of ran, ran with it. Okay. Okay. That, um, now I'm, I'm about to, uh, really show my, my geekness here. So <laughs> when, when you said that the first thing that came to mind was Mixoplex. And I don't know if you, if you like read comics or anything like that, but Mixoplex <laughs> was this fifth dimensional character uh, that was a nemesis of Superman. And the only way Superman could get Mixoplex to go back to his own dimension. So like he could control like pretty much anything, like he could create, you know, create things out of thin air uh, and things like that. Like he was God-like and so to speak. Right. Uh, but the only way to get him to go back to his dimension and kind of leave like, you know, earth third dimension alone is to get him to say his name backwards and his name backwards, backwards was Klibbleskim for all my nerd people, who geek people who read comics. <laughs> yeah. That kind of reminds me of Candyman, right? You say his name five times <laughs> in the mirror, right? or three times he appears right. or bloody Mary. <laughs> right. But the, 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 the rub about that is he had to get Mixoplex to say his own name backwards. So, so Superman would like come up with all these clever ways to get Mixoplex to say his name backwards. Like one time he got him to say it backwards by skywriting his name backwards, you know, using like an airplane and, you know, smoke and things like that. And he was like, look, what is that? It was like, oh, that says blah, blah, blah. And next thing you know, he'll, he'll disappear and be back in this dimension. But anyhow, 
that's <laughs> <laughs> that whole thing your name backwards is is kind of what, what drove me to that so sorry about that anyhow so t- tell us what, what motivated you to start your podcast what motivated me to start the yizzy research podcast was a few things um one i mentioned that I knew that when I started my coaching program, I knew that not everyone could afford that. So having a podcast allowed me to answer a lot of common research questions and also feature guests um, to help provide that information for free. Um, Also, secondly, I get a lot of questions, especially on LinkedIn about UX research, and I can't always answer every question. So if Mm -hmm. I get enough questions, I'll just make an episode about it. Um, There's that. And then also, lastly, I do use it to promote I do use it, the podcast, to promote my business itself. So I'll promote the coaching program, my research services. So it serves a variety of reasons. So it's a mix of being able to help other people, but also to help myself as well and to promote the business too. So what? tell us a little bit about some of the topics uh, that, that you cover. I know you mentioned some of them earlier. Yeah, some of the topics that I cover, I talk about UX research, career coaching, and mentorship. Um, I talk about like the personality traits of good researchers, what do UX researchers actually do in a day? Um, how to ace the UX research interview? I also have like a few market research. Re- I also have a few market researchers come on and talk about what they do. Mm. Um, in the future, I do plan to have different types of researchers as well. But those are like a sampling of topics that I've talked about so far. And generally, I try to keep the episodes pretty like digestible. So right. in the episodes where it's just me by myself, it's like fifteen minutes or less which you mentioned earlier that producing a podcast is no joke for a 15 minute episode. It can take me months to put it together. It's crazy how much time it takes to produce these. Um, (laughs) It takes a lot of time, but that that's about how long it takes when it's by, when it's me by myself, when I have guests, the episode can range to from about can range anywhere from 30 minutes to about an hour. So I have some short form, um, quick digestible episodes and also some longer form episodes as well. That's a sampling of what to expect with the podcast. Okay. And how can people uh, subscribe to that podcast? How can they find out more about it? Yeah, wherever they listen to podcasts. So Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, the, the Yizzy Research website, which is yzziresearch.com. And I have a section there where you can find um, the show notes from the podcast and also listen to episodes there as well. But anywhere where you listen to episodes um, pop- popularly, you can find the podcast there. Okay. And before we get out of here, um, what's next for you? I want to continue building up Yizzy Research and also getting into audio production as well. Um, I really love producing a podcast. So I'd like to do more audio production and media production in the future, but more immediately, definitely continuing to build up Yizzy Research, build up my clientele, um, helping more people in terms of coaching and also having more clients as well. And how can people follow you, contact you? you know, give us all your hand, your Twitter handles, Instagram, all that stuff. Yeah. So it's easy to find me because everything is branded. Um, so on Twitter, you can find me at Yizzy Research, Y-Z-Z-I Research. I post tips there weekly about UX research, getting hired, et cetera. And also the same with LinkedIn. Um, for my LinkedIn, you can just search my name, Imani Nichols, I-M-A-N-I-N-I-C-H-O-L-S. And um, every week or two, I post tips there as well about UX research, about interviews, case studies. I post information there too. So LinkedIn and Twitter are the two best ways to follow me and get in touch and stay in touch as well. Well, uh, well, Imani, I, I really appreciate you coming on to the show, telling us about your journey, telling us about UX researching uh, and telling us about, you know, some of the fabulous things you're doing uh, with your company, with your podcast, with your coaching. Uh, and we wish you the best of luck and, and you know, later on, you know, kind of check in with us and and let us know how things are going. Definitely. Definitely. I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity. This was really fun and it was good talking with you. Same here. Same here. Uh, So take care and uh, we'll be in contact soon. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Take care. Bye. Blacks in technology. Black, 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 blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology. Blacks in technology. Black, blacks in technology.